It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, I would like my colleagues here to imagine themselves as a migrant worker, a refugee who fled persecution, or a newcomer who came to Ontario with dreams of a good life. Now imagine you had an urgent health issue for which you needed treatment. On Friday, you'd be able to access care without having to worry about how you'd pay for it. But by Saturday, that care became a lot harder to access because this government cruelly eliminated the Physician and Hospital Services for Uninsured Persons program. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Will she restore this program to make sure no one risks going without receiving the care they need? To reply, the Deputy Premier, the Minister of Health. Thank you. I want to be very clear that that migrant worker, that um, internationally uh, student who is here to be part of our school system, are all and continue to be covered through their health system, through Ontario's publicly funded health system. There is no change in the way that uninsured persons will receive care in the province of Ontario. The change that occurred was as a result of a program that we put in place when travellers could not return home. We have removed that change because we have a system in the province of Ontario where individuals are covered for OHIP funded services and we have uh, a number of pathways for individuals to get um, funding through their health care system, even without an OHIP card, of course. I'll share more in the supplementary. Supplementary question. I'm really concerned about how out of touch this government is because what the minister is saying does not square with what people out there are actually experiencing. I'd like my colleagues to imagine that you are actually working at a community health centre. An uninsured client has come in. Their needs are beyond what you are able to provide. On Friday, you would have been able to connect them to the help they need so they can focus on getting better. But by Saturday, your client has to make a decision between paying their rent that month or getting better. It's never too late to do the right thing, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health. Will she reverse her decision so no one is forced to make such an impossible choice? So I, I'm actually going to quote a staff individual who works at the Niagara Community Health Centre. Quote, we offer primary care services to folks with or without a health card with or without a health card. There are 75 community health care centers operating in the province of Ontario that have a funding model that allows them to serve and assist individuals without a health care uh, without a health care card. We have, of course, funding programs in place with midwifery, mid midwives that ensures individuals who need assistance through the midwives program are able to do that with or without an OHIP card. There is no doubt that we want to protect the most vulnerable, but we also have to ensure that we have parameters in place to make sure unintended consequences don't occur and we Response. end up in Ontario being the health care for everyone else who chooses to come here to access this system. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, if this government spent less time in the back rooms and more time on the front lines, they would understand the impact of their choices. As it happens, as it happens, I spent time with Niagara Community Health Centre workers last week. And the reality is that these programs the minister keeps mentioning are woefully inadequate. I met with one CHC worker on Friday, Speaker, from Niagara. Her CHC has a budget of a little over $1,000 to help uninsured clients. Just $1,000, Speaker. She told me, you know, that doesn't go very far. One year, just two clients. There are 500,000 uninsured people in this province. Back to the Minister of Health. If she won't restore the program, will she immediately boost investments in CHCs to make sure no one goes without the health care they need? Members will please take their seats. 
again. The Minister of Health to respond. Speaker, you know, another program that we have operating in the province of Ontario, all across Ontario, is of course Health 811, where individuals who have questions and concerns can deal and speak directly with the registered nurse. You know, we are returning to a program where there is no change in the uninsured persons and receiving, in, receiving care in the province of Ontario. And in terms of the member's question about expanding, I hope that as we continue to debate and vote on Bill 60, they will look at the expansions that are embedded in that legislation and vote to support expansions that are occurring and will be occurring because of the investments that our government is making in health to ensure that people get access to service in their communities. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, in the 11th hour, the government extended funding for virtual ERs for just three months. Too little, too late. The government's announcement came too late for most hospitals, like Toronto's University Health Network, which is now having to close their virtual ER. Speaker, to the Minister of Health, will the government commit to making virtual ER funding permanent? Minister of Health. Perhaps the member opposite's uh, information is not quite up to date. I, in fact, have spoken to University Health Network, and they intend to continue the virtual ER program because they have seen the value in it. We worked with the OMA to extend that program as we work with the Ontario Medical Association to make sure, where appropriate, virtual care continues in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. That gives them three months, Speaker, right? This government likes to talk about healthcare innovations. Well, let's talk about innovation. Virtual ERs were a pandemic era innovation to reduce pressure on hospitals and keep healthcare public. They connected Ontarians to the care they needed and helped ease hospital overloading. But this government's last minute, 11th hour decision to extend and by just three months has effectively cancelled the program. Back to the Minister of Health. Why is this government saying no to these public health care innovations? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, uh, health care innovation is exactly what we love to see in the province of Ontario. And, and I will give the member opposite a very specific example. In Renfrew County, they were able to ramp up a VTech model that has ensured individuals who do not have direct connection and contact with a family physician now have a permanent solution. They did that innovation during COVID. We have now funded it because of the advocacy of the member from Renfrew to ensure that that program can continue. That's the kind of innovation we're encouraging. The final supplementary. Speaker, it's not just virtual emergency rooms either. Hundreds of people gathered in Chesley in a town hall held by the local health coalition to talk about their fears around Bill 60, as their local ER again continues to have unexpected temporary closures. Back to the Minister of Health, what do you have to say to the people of Chesley and the 158 other communities experiencing temporary ER closures due to staffing shortages? Minister of Health. You know, the, uh, the public meeting that the member opposite referenced is actually community coming together to solve problems. They have a new hospital president and CEO who will bring that innovation and those ideas to ensure that absolutely the Chesley uh, Emergency Department does not have the same challenges that they had last summer. It is important for the member opposite to understand that as our government expands the number of pathways for individuals to be able to train and become nurses in the province of Ontario, like the Learn and Stay program, as we work with the College of Nurses of Ontario to ensure that individuals who are waiting to get their license assessed get that done quickly, we have made those changes, Speaker, and we will continue to make those changes. Why? Because we want to ensure that people who want to practice medicine and serve the people of Response. Ontario can do it quickly in the province of Ontario. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Families across Ontario are struggling with the high cost of living. A mom in Niagara contacted my office about the price of baby formula going up 40 per cent in the last three months, a product that is essential for many families with babies. 
formula going from $50 in January to over $70 today is simply price gouging from companies like Loblaws. The Premier promised there would be consequences for retailers who price gouge on necessary items. Speaker, that mom has a question for the Premier. Why is the Premier letting this to happen? Why is he breaking his promise? Thank you. Reply, the Premier. I want to, I want to thank the member from uh, Niagara. I'll tell you what we're doing, and I'll tell you a little bit about economics because I know the NDP don't have a clue about economics. I wouldn't trust them running my lemonade stand, but anyways, in, in saying that, economics, what drives cost up about 30% of inflation is gas prices. And the folks across the aisle, they're for the highest carbon tax in, in the world. The member from Ottawa was preaching he wants the highest gas prices in the world, highest carbon taxes. That's what drives up the cost. Our government reduced the cost of gas by 10 cents a litre. I encourage the NDP, I encourage the Liberals, not the fall in step with the federal government, but stand up for the people of Ontario, reduce the gas price, reduce the carbon tax, put money back into people's pockets rather than just sit there and complain. Order. Supplementary question. Yeah, back to the Premier. Premier, we're asking about feeding a baby. That's what this question is about, sir. The Conservative bu budget does nothing to address the affordability Order. crisis. They refuse to stand at the price gouging corporations like the Weston. Companies are taking advantage of families that are just trying to feed their children. Some families, listen to this, Speaker, some families are watering down baby formula to stretch it further. Unreal. What kind of province are we living in where the Premier thinks it's okay for billionaires to make record profits while gouging families struggling to feed their babies? What will it take for the Premier to stand up these corporate bullies ripping off families in Ontario so we can feed our families? Thank you. In reply, the Premier. The member from Niagara voted against every single tax de decrease we've ever had in the legislature. He voted against putting money back into people's pockets when we scrapped the license sticker. You, you voted against putting, people, putting money back into people's pocket when it came to 412 and 418. If it Opposition was up to the NDP and the Liberals, we saw what happened for 15 years, Mr. Right. Speaker. The prices went up un, out of control. Companies left this province. 300,000 people lost Order. their jobs under, under their uh, 15 years. The destruction of this province. Order. The economy is strong. Anyone who wants a job can get a job. Anyone who wants a great paying job in any sector, we're leading North America in economic development, job creation. We're seeing Response. more people come to our province, more jobs being created than anywhere in North America. But thank you for that. Stop the clock. Order. Thank you. Restart the clock. The member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. We know that Ontario has a unique and carefully cultivated entrepreneurial spirit. Yet, for more than a decade under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's entrepreneurs felt abandoned. The previous government did everything to punish people starting a business, but our government is focused on supporting small businesses like the ones in my riding of Scarborough Rouge Park, making sure they have the support they need to strengthen their economic success. Speaker, will the minister please explain how our government is creating conditions for Ontario's entrepreneurs to succeed? Good question. Development, job creation and trade. Speaker, we can all recall the days under the Liberals when Ontario's entrepreneurs were closing up their shops, frustrated with a government that made businesses too risky and expensive. But our government changed all that. Lower taxes, less red tape brought a revival of Ontario's entrepreneurial spirit. There were 85,000 new businesses opened in Ontario last year alone. Speaker. 
and with Budget 23, expect even more. An additional $2 million is being invested into Futurepreneur Canada. They'll help 18-year-old and to 39-year-old young uh, business people with mentorship and loans of up to $20,000. Speaker, entrepreneurs once again Response. can take that next step and know that their government is here to support them all the way. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his answer. It's great to hear that our government continues to support Ontario's entrepreneurs with starting and growing their businesses. My riding of Scarborough Rouge Park is home to a thriving and innovative economy for entrepreneurs. And starting a business is how entrepreneurs turn their dream into a reality. But as well, we all know, starting a business is a hard work and is filled with risk. <clears throat> Speaker, will the minister please explain what else our government is doing to help entrepreneurs get their businesses off the ground? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Liberals made starting a business in Ontario costly and confusing. That is why our government reduced red tape, re lowered taxes, and fixed their hydro mess. Ontario businesses are now saving $8 billion annually. And in addition to Futurepreneur, there's a wide range of other supports. Small business enterprise centers offer all the tools they need to start and grow their businesses. In the member's riding, he pushed very hard for $2 million in funding for Scarborough's Small Business Business Center, with a further $620,000 for their summer company and starter company plus. That helps their area students and young entrepreneurs start their business in his riding. And we've provided more than $77,000 in digital transformation grants to over 30 businesses in Scarborough. Response. Speaker, that is what this member is doing to help his entrepreneurs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario is facing a mental health crisis. Across the province, people are crying out for help. Mental health organizations are unable to keep up with rising inflation costs, staffing shortages, and increased demands for services. All Ontarians should have access to high-quality, easily accessible, connected supports when and where they need it. Speaker, why won't the Premier properly address the mental health crisis in Ontario? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Mental health and addictions is a priority for our government, and it has been since day one. And that's why we're making crucial investments in mental health and addictions. We're creating a recovery-oriented system, a continuum of care by which everyone will be able to get supports and services as needed. And that's, with respect, with respect to that, making a $500 million investment annually over the next 10 years. In addition to that, recognizing the needs in the province, the Minister of Finance announced last week an additional investment of $425 million over three years and an additional $202 million in support of housing. Why? Because it is one of the most important social determinants of health that must be addressed. That is investments that are being made by the, by the province, and it's being recognized by community members. And perhaps in the supplemental, I'll give you some of the response points from the service providers that are partnering with us to ensure that we deliver these services to the people of the province. The supplementary question. Speaker, community agencies are facing a staffing crisis. Wait times for treatments grows longer and longer. I spoke to a woman who was sexually assaulted and nearly beaten to death. She lived in her car for months afterwards, and she's been waiting for trauma counselling through the public health system for four months and counting. For $30,000 a month, she could get treatment in a private clinic immediately. Access to mental health supports shouldn't depend on your ability to pay. Kids wait an average 67 days for counselling and 92 days for intensive treatment. People are literally dying waiting for help. Why is this Premier shortchanging public mental health services when lives depend on early and consistent access to care? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, once again, I reiterate, we are building a system of care that looks after individuals where and when they need it. In fact, Camille Queenville, the CEO of CMHA, the, the, I quote, the vital structural base funding commitment announced today is the largest by any government for community mental health and addictions care in a decade. It will significantly help community-based mental health and addictions agencies provide high-quality care, retain dedicated and committed staff, and address rising operating costs. The budget is an overwhelmingly positive sign that the government understands the strain our sector is facing as we support Ontarians living with mental health and addictions challenges. It also demonstrates a desire to help those most vulnerable in society with respect to children and youth. A quote forwarded to me from Tatum Wilson, Children's Response. and Mental Health. We're pleased that today's budget commits significant new funding to mental health and addictions. These investments are critical to begin to stabilize community, children, and youth mental health supports. Mr. Speaker, our partners are li we listening to our partners. And Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. The previous Liberal governments missed many opportunities to build up Ontario. They didn't invest in skilled trades training and didn't support the tradespeople who are the backbone of our economy. As a result of their indifference and neglect, Ontario is not only facing a shortage of skilled trades worker, our government is also left man to manage and correct health and safety issues for workers that should have been fixed years ago. As an example, workers on some construction sites continue to face issues accessing clean washroom facilities. This is wrong, disrespectful, and totally unnecessary. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the health and safety needs of workers on construction sites? Here, here. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, to the member uh, for Thornhill for this really important question. Uh, speaker, in Ontario today, about 600,000 people work in construction. Each and every one of them are heroes, and it's time they got the dignity and respect they deserve. For far too long, Mr. Speaker, uh, politicians and others have looked down their noses at people in the skilled trades. No more. Over the last two months, my ministry inspectors have visited more than 1,800 job sites and inspected their washrooms. They found over 240 washroom-related violations, missing doors, missing walls, no place to wash your hands, and worst of all, no toilets on job sites. Speaker, in what other industry would this be acceptable? These are people who are building our communities, not livestock. I've spoken to workers who tell me washrooms have been an issue for generations. This ends today. We're working for workers and making sure our washrooms are clean for these heroes. Response, the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response and his dedicated work. The workers building a strong Ontario for the next generation shouldn't have difficulty accessing clean and reliable washroom facilities while working. No one, especially those who are doing the necessary work to grow our province's economy, deserve this. Unlike the previous Liberal government, we need to eliminate any barriers to entry for the skilled trades, and we need to protect the health and safety of our workers. Our government must take direct action to clean up job sites, including expanding washroom facilities and holding, holding workplaces accountable for failing to uphold health and safety standards. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on what actions our government is taking to ensure health and safety standards are respected? Here, here. Good lady. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I find it really interesting that the NDP and Liberals are heckling on this very important matter. It just goes to show you, Mr. Speaker, that Order. the NDP don't give Order. a damn about workers Order. in this province. Order. But, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of our Premier, last month we announced our government is requiring cleaner washrooms for all 600,000 construction workers. Order. We're doubling the number of washrooms on construction sites. We're mandating that they be clean private and well-lit. We're also requiring they have hand sanitizer when running water isn't possible and that large job sites have women's only washrooms. Speaker, it's unacceptable that anyone is making a career choice based on washroom quality. 
For over 100 years, Ontario's Minister of Labour had never done a washroom blitz. Under our government, we launched the first one in history, and the second blitz is starting this week. Only our government, under the leadership of this Premier, is getting it done for our frontline workers and our heroes, those construction workers. Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. In an emergency, there's no worse feeling than being unable to contact emergency services or our loved ones. With the recent terrible acts of violence on the TTC, having access to cellular service in the subway tunnels would make people feel safer in a crisis. The infrastructure is there, but Big Telecom is not willing to use it. Does this government think that's right? And if not, what are they willing to do about it? Mm. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. We are all deeply concerned about the uh, increased number of violent incidents on public transit in the last few weeks, and all levels of government agree on the importance of ensuring that transit systems uh, across the province are safe. And so we remain open to continuing discussions with our partners on how we can work to achieve this. And I know that transit riders want to re remain connected when they're riding public transit. That's why in 2020, our government took steps to improve connectivity and implemented free Wi-Fi on all GO buses and trains. As the member opposite knows, the TTC is operated by the City of Toronto. And as such, the City of Toronto is responsible for finding a resolution with the telecommunications carriers. I encourage the City of Toronto and Response. the future Mayor to find a resolution of this, on this matter as quickly as possible. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, we need to promote ridership on the TTC, which includes more service and better service. The TTC has been trying for more than a, than a decade to introduce cell service across the system, but there has been no interest from the big three, Rogers, Bell or TELUS. Cell service on the TTC plays a role in public safety and is a measure that should already be in place but isn't. Does the minister agree that in 2023, cell service on transit is essential? If so, what action is she going to take to fix this? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the members, member opposite for the question. I absolutely agree that cell service on public transit is essential, and that's why our government took the important step in 2020 of ensuring that we have free Wi-Fi on GO trains and buses. The public transit system under the jurisdiction of the province of Ontario now has free Wi-Fi because we agree that it's essential. Mr. Speaker, we've been supporting public transit for years, especially throughout the pandemic. The province has given over $1.5 billion to the TTC to ensure that its system could remain operational throughout the pandemic. We work closely with the TTC, and we continue to urge them to find a resolution to ensure that riders on the TTC can have free Wi-Fi as soon as possible. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a bit odd that on a day we are going to debate a motion to protect police officers. I need to ask about protecting the public from po police officers. Police officers hold important responsibility and to maintain public trust and confidence in our police services, we must ensure that our police officers are held to the highest of standards when it comes to their conduct. Unfortunately, that has not been the case with a particular officer in Leeds County. Despite being convicted for drug trafficking, forgery, and sexual assault, this officer has been on paid leave since 2015, even making it on the Sunshine List during this time. Mr. Speaker, if receiving three separate convictions for serious offences is not enough for a police officer to lose their job, how can the public trust the officers tasked with their safety? So can the Solicitor General explain why officers who have been convicted of serious offences are not automatically released from service in our police forces? To respond, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her question. Let me be clear, no one convicted of serious and disturbing crimes like these should be receiving a taxpayer-funded salary. Our government brought forward legislation, the Community Safety and Policing Act, that once in force will allow a chief of police to suspend an officer without pay if the officer is charged with a serious offence. 
And this legislation, as members know, replaces a piece of legislation that's over 30 years old. Our expectation, Mr. Speaker, is those who keep our province safe uphold the highest standards of professional ethics, and Mr. Speaker, we will accept nothing less. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the minister, actually. Mr. Speaker, the Community Safety and Policing Act that the Solicitor General is referring to was passed in this legislature over four years ago receiving royal assent on March 26, 2019, yet it has still not come into force. For shame. Similarly, the Accommodation Sector Registration of Guest Act received royal assent almost two years ago, on June 3, 2021, and has also not yet come into force. Mr. Speaker, when the legislature adopts legislation, it does so because the enacted changes are deemed necessary to resolve important and often pressing issues in our society. Certain clauses in the Community Safety and Policing Act, for example, would have enabled a chief police to suspend without pay the officer I mentioned earlier, just like the solicitor mentioned. The Accommodation Sector Registration Question. of Guest Act was meant to help better combat human trafficking, an urgent issue in this province. Speaker, can the government please explain why it has decided not to bring into force <clears throat> important legislation adopted by this legislature? Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for her question. Mr. Speaker, I have directed the Deputy, Ministry, the, the Deputy Minister to complete the discussions with our associations, First Nation and, in, and Indigenous Police Services, as soon as possible so that we can move forward with the, with the enactment of the new legislation. I want to repeat again that no one convicted of a serious crime and disturbing crime like these should be receiving a taxpayer-funded salary. And we expect all those that keep our province safe to uphold the highest standard of professional ethics. And Mr. Speaker, I'll repeat it. We will accept nothing less. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. For the people who live, work, or travel through the western part of the GTA, Highway 413 will make a significant difference to their quality of life. I consistently hear from local families and businesses in Brampton West that the potential for an easier commute is important to them. Mr. Speaker, for this reason, the voters of Peel Region supported our government's pledge to build Highway 413 and elected PC MPPs in every riding along the planned route. Highway 413 is essential to alleviating congestion, creating good jobs, and preparing our province for the expected population growth over the next 30 years. Mr. Speaker, this project is essential not only for the people of Brampton, but is necessary for the overall prosperity of Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain how Highway 413 will contribute to supporting our province economy? Reply, Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. He is absolutely right, Speaker. The people of Ontario and Peel Region spoke loud and clear when they re-elected our government with an even larger majority last June. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, they want to see Highway 413 built. The NDP and the Liberals are completely out of touch with the challenges Ontarians are facing right now. Toronto already ranks as the seventh most congested city in the entire world and our major highways are at or reaching capacity. The average Toronto driver, Mr. Speaker, lost 118 hours, or nearly five days, sitting in traffic this past year alone. The cost to move goods is rising, and building new highways will ensure that our hospitals have the resources that they need and that our grocery store shelves are stocked. The status quo that the opposition parties want to maintain is hurting Ontario families, and it's hurting Bonds. our economy. Speaker, Ontario needs Highway 413, and our government is delivering. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Ontario needs new infrastructure to help move people and goods forward, or Peel Region will become quickly overwhelmed. The previous Liver government ignored the need to build vital transportation networks to keep up with the GTA's growing population and expanding business needs. The hardworking people in my riding and across Peel region know that Highway 413 will make life easier for them. However, they are frustrated by the continued opposition to this important project. The people of Brampton expect our government to move forward 
with building Highway 413, but now the federal liberals and Mr. Gibo are trying to stop this project. Amen. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government's investment in critical highway infrastructure is vital for Ontario's future? Minister of Transportation. Speaker, thank you. The Liberals and the NDP's efforts to disrupt and delay this project just show how out of touch they really are. Gridlock already costs our economy more than $11 billion per year, and it adds nearly $400 million to the cost of our goods. If we don't get Highway 413 built, the goods that we rely on will only get more expensive. Speaker, we know that building Highway 413 is the right thing to do, and we cannot afford any more delay. In March of 2020, the federal government wrote to MTO that Highway 413 did not meet the criteria for a federal impact assessment. Yet months before the last election, they moved the goalpost. That's why last week my ministry sent a letter to the federal government expressing that this is unacceptable, especially for a project that is so critical to our province. Response? Mr. Speaker, it's clear that Minister Gilbo will do anything to stop this project from getting built. I encourage the opposition to support this project, and I encourage the Liberal MPs in Peel Region to stand up in their caucus and to stand up to their federal minister. Support Highway Thank you. The next question. A member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. The government recently passed Bill 46, which doubled down on a band-aid solution to our court staffing problems. Instead of expediting efforts to hire more judges, retired judges can now return to work up to 75 per cent full-time hours, a plan that is expensive, flawed and unsustainable. My question to the Premier is simple. Why won't his government clear the court backlog with a proper plan, which includes actually appointing more new full-time judges? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to paraphrase the Leader of the Opposition, if the NDP spent more time on solutions and less time on headlines, here, here. they might actually support us in what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 would be, I, would be pleased, I would be pleased to say that in Bill 46 that was brought by my, my honourable uh, friend, the Minister of Red Tape Reduction, which indeed did make a positive change, I would love to say that the NTP supported us with that, Mr. Speaker. But in fact, of course, as you would expect, they did not. Now, Mr. Speaker, in terms of adding more judges, we have added another judge, Mr. Speaker. We've added a judge to Fort Francis recently, and I think that's a fantastic addition. Yeah. We're constantly doing improvements to make sure we have court capacity. And I would ask my, my friend across the way why, in fact, the NDP didn't support us in Bill 46 as we enabled more capacity of judges to attend in court, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The, uh, the honourable member did not answer the question, so let me give him a new one. Last week, the case of a police officer accused of sexual assault was thrown out, not because of the merits of the case, but because it was assigned to a semi-retired judge who took an extended vacation, which then caused an unconstitutional, unconstitutional trial delay. These kinds of scheduling issues are entirely predictable, and they will happen more and more as this government increases our reliance on part-time judges. Our justice system is now being held together by duct tape. Speaker, is this government so out of touch that they don't recognize the long-term investments needed to ensure the people of Ontario get access to justice in a timely fashion? The Attorney General. Again, Mr. Speaker, if they spend more time on the front lines and less time on headlines, Mr. Speaker, we would actually be able to work together to improve the system. But we'll do it without them. That's okay, Mr. Speaker. It's, it, I'm not going to speak to any particular case, but I cannot believe that the NDP are calling for me to interfere with judicial independence and scheduling of courts, oh. Mr. Speaker. I just cannot believe it. Next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Minister of Infrastructure. Hmm. Constituents in my riding of Richmond Hill and individuals and families across the province continue to rely on our hardworking hospitals when they need access to health care and medical services. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, critical health care infrastructure was not a priority. The failure to make investment in projects that were important to communities left our health care system crumbling, overcrowded, and unprepared, especially when we needed it the most. 
While significant work is already underway in many, um, in many communities to improve and expand our hospitals, there is still more work that is urgently needed. Question. Speaker, this minister, can I ask the minister to explain how our government is addressing the health care infrastructure needs? Health and fear. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, our government was elected on a strong, with a stronger mandate to build Ontario, particularly build a res resilient health care system. In our most recent budget, Mr. Speaker, we are allocating $48 billion to expand hospitals across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, $32 billion of that are grants that will go to increase bed capacity increase the number of operating rooms, as well as expand emergency departments in communities. Last week, Mr. Speaker, we released a request for qualifications. I know my seatmate mm -hmm. is very thrilled about this. For the Quinty Health Hospital, this will be a brand new hospital in Eastern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure that if you are in need of care in the province of Ontario, you will be able to receive it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to our Minister. Not only have you been working very hard on infrastructure for hospital, you've worked very hard on transportation and on education. I thank you for that. Investment made by our government into the hospital sector remain vital and is welcome news for the people of my riding in Richmond Hill and all Ontarians. However, the infrastructure needs of our long-term care homes are equally important and deserve immediate action. Sadly, after 15 years under the leadership of the previous Liberal government, their neglect and indifference resulted in long-term care homes that were outdated, in, in disrepair and overcrowded. Our government must address capacity issues in the long-term care system now. My constituents in Richmond Hill and the people of our province expect our government Question. to get shovels on the ground to accelerate and the development of the long-term care homes. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is addressing the infrastructure needs in our long-term care sector? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just like building hospitals, we are building long-term care homes across this province, Mr. Speaker, but not just regular long-term care homes. We are making sure that they are built with modern standards, that they are safe, and that they are com comfortable places for their patients. Mr. Speaker, the Minis Minister of Long-Term Care, my ministry, Ministry of Infrastructure, we're working together to make sure that we address the long wait lists. We are on our way to address uh, to building 31,000 new beds and upgrading 28,000 beds across Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, you've heard me speak about the rapid delivery program where we build a long-term care home in 13 months in Ajax. Mr. Speaker, we are almost ready to open two more, two more long-term care homes in Mississauga, which will activate 600 beds, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Response? By building hospitals and long-term care homes, we are protecting our most vulnerable. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. My question for the Premier Minister. Thank you. Question for the Premier. A very large housing crisis. But imagine facing it for 30 years. Imagine having no access to your own traditional land to expand and build on. This is a sad and reality for Ottawa Piscat First Nation and many others. These communities have solutions but are stuck behind government red tape and pass around from one government to another. Premier, when is this government going to step up, put a plan into action with a long-term solution as it should and start helping First Nations like Ottawa Piscat. Persistent member for Thunder Bay, Atacoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. There is an urgent need for adequate housing to meet the basic needs of many First Nations, especially across Ontario's far north. For many First Nations in Ontario, this has meant living in houses that lack basic services such as clean drinking water and adequate heating, ventilation and insulation. While the federal government is responsible for housing on reserve, 
Ontario provides support for off-reserve affordable housing, supportive housing, capital repairs, and rent supplements for Indigenous people. We will continue to work, work working with Indigenous communities and organizations to ensure the federal government is living up to its responsibility to provide good, safe housing to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people across Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, let me remind the government that they're a signatory to Treaty 9. Years have gone by, yet nothing is moving. Since 2014, there was a task force in place. Then in 2018, a memorandum of understanding. Then a new renewed relation commitment signed by your minister in 2019. All Ottawa Fiscat got so far are two plastic igloos as temporary housing. Premier, First Nation chiefs are telling us your government is not acting on any of their issues. I ask again, when will this government put things in motion and actually do the work that is supposed to be done? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you for the question. On October 18th, our government announced an additional $2.1 million to help create 21 transitional housing units for Indigenous people enrolled in educational programs at the Matawa Training and Wellness Centre. In March, our government invested an additional $6.7 million in the Indigenous Supportive Housing Program, bringing the total annual investment to $30 million. We recognize how important culturally appropriate housing is for Indigenous communities and how critical these services are to improving the physical, mental and social well-being of Indigenous people across Ontario. Through the Indigenous Supportive Housing Program, our government is more than doubling Ontario's annual investment in Indigenous Supportive Housing to ensure those Response. at risk for homelessness have access to the resources they need and deserve. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to first congratulate uh, the member from Mississauga Streetsville on her new role as the Associate Minister of Housing. <laughs> My question to the Associate Minister is, with the ongoing uh, global economic uncertainty, our government continues to make significant investments in programs to help the most vulnerable in our province. For people who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness, it is essential that they have access to the right housing supports and services they need. However, the reality is that Ontario has both an affordable housing crisis and a homelessness crisis. More resources are needed to build upon the work that we've already uh, work already underway to bring forward more measures uh, to address the serious issues. Speaker, can the associate minister please explain what additional supports will be provided for those experiencing homelessness or for those who are at risk of homelessness as a part of our recent budget? The associate minister of housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I really want to thank the great member from Brampton East for the incredible work that he's doing in his riding. Speaker, I am so proud to say that the 2023 budget has provided an additional $202 million to the Homelessness Prevention Program. This represents a 40% increase from the previous amount, bringing the total close to $700 million in annual investments. Also, Speaker, collaborating with multi-ministries to ensure that the right supports are in the right place at the right time for those most vulnerable is so critical. Speaker, the housing supply crisis is impacting Ontarians right across this province, and we know it will take time to fully implement the policies we have put forward. But I'm confident with this Premier and this government, we are heading in the right direction. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. It's welcome news that the 2023 budget provides greater funding investments that focus on providing vulnerable Ontarians with the support they need to stay in their homes and to get the housing they need. For many Ontarians that need our help, this funding will go a long way to improve their living situation. The nature and scope of homelessness is different in every region, and it's essential that our government continues to work closely with community partners to make the most impact on reducing and preventing homelessness. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how this additional funding will address the needs for individuals and families in local communities across the province? 
The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to my colleague for the question. The best way to deal with homelessness is to be proactive and prevent it in the first place. We've heard from organizations and key stakeholders across the province who are pleased to see we are increasing funding for the Homelessness Prevention Program and have expressed to us how much this means to them. For example, Speaker, the Chief Accountability Office for the Kenora District, Henry Wall, said, the Kenora District Service Board is grateful to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Government of Ontario for this historic increase in the Homelessness Prevention Program and service managers' ability to better address the needs of our communities. Addressing Ontario's affordable housing and homelessness crisis will take all levels of government to work together. The flexibility built into the HPP program will facilitate community-driven solutions and addressing homelessness to increase supportive housing options for vulnerable people. Speaker, local service managers and representatives know their communities best, and it is our job Response. to ensure they have the tools and resources they need to deliver effective support to those who need it most. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In AMO's response to the recent budget, they stated they are, quote, disappointed not to seek commitments from the Government of Ontario with respect to when and how the government will follow through on its commitment to make municipalities whole from the fiscal impacts of Bill 23. Ontario municipalities are losing $5 billion in infrastructure revenue. Why is this government breaking their word and cutting funding to municipalities and housing at a time when the need to support our municipal partners has never been greater? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, I know why the member opposite won't ever be the finance critic for the New Democratic <laughs> Party. So, Speaker, um, as I said in, our, in response to the Leader of the Opposition last week, the number one and number two request from our municipal partners for the budget was more dollars for supportive housing and more wraparound services for mental health and addiction. We delivered on that budget, something that at second reading the NDP voted against. But, Speaker, you know who last week really uh, let municipalities down? Jagmeet Singh and Justin Trudeau. Yeah. There was no new infrastructure yeah. dollars in last week's budget for municipalities. There was no support for the City of Toronto, and I had a great meeting on Friday with Deputy Mayor McKelvey thanking us for our commitment on supportive housing uh, and on our contributions that we promised. And there was no clarity on any of the provincial or territorial requests Response. on housing as part of the national housing strategy. We continue to be shortchanged $480 million, something that Jagmeet and Justin need to fix. Question, the member for University Rosedale. Uh, thank you, Minister. I mean, thank you, Speaker. My question is back to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. Peel Region has a housing master plan to build 2,400 new affordable homes on public land by 2028. The member for Brampton South even went to the announcement to celebrate the plan's launch. The problem is this. Peel's housing plan is now in jeopardy of failing because the region is losing $200 million in revenue because of your government's Bill 23. Minister, how much money exactly are you going to give, is the government going to give, to Peel so their affordable housing plan can be revived? Speaker, the bottom line is that municipal support from the province of Ontario is at an all-time high. You know, you know, if the NDP want to talk about taxing affordable housing Shame. in the middle of a housing supply crisis, Shame. well, I've got That's a message right. back to the NDP. The housing minister says no way. Yep. <laughs> Next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the hardworking Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. The Lake Simcoe watershed contains key natural, urban and agricultural systems that are vital to Ontario and to the people in my riding of Simcoe Gray. As our government continues to build Ontario and grow our economy, evolving pressures like population growth present ongoing challenges to our ecosystems and waterways. Some of my constituents have expressed concerns about the sustainability of land and water uses across Lake Simcoe. Our government must continue to respond to emergency, uh, emerging issues and adapt with solutions that protect critical aspects of our environment. Speaker, 
Can the minister please explain what action our government is taking to protect Lake Simcoe now and for future generations? Good question. Minister of the Environment, Conservation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank uh, that fantastic member for its important question. It's on the minds. It's on the minds of, of many whom I've had the opportunity to visit in the Lake Simcoe region, and that's why my ministry and the incredible team at Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks is working hard to implement the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. Uh, speaker, by working with partners, uh, including Indigenous communities, municipalities, uh, Speaker, we recognize the need to manage and expand and lay the critical infrastructure required for growth while also protecting the environment. That's why I'm proud to say, uh, Speaker, that working uh, with with communities there, we've ensured um, that this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has made the largest single investment into phosphorus reduction in that lake's history. That's building the critical infrastructure we need. Building the critical infrastructure we need to support tomorrow's growth while also protecting uh, Lake Simcoe for generations to come. And I'm very proud of the leadership of this Premier and government. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I'm pleased to hear that our government is implementing measures to guarantee that the future of this vital resource is protected. Under the leadership of our government, we have seen improvements such as a decrease in the amount of algae in Lake Simcoe, which greatly enhances water quality over the long term. It is evident that our government remains committed to improving the overall ecosystem of Lake Simcoe. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our Lake Simcoe phosphorus reduction strategy will support the neighbouring communities? Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate again the question from the member opposite. Uh, Speaker, we understand that more needs to be done to preserve and protect this valuable lake. That's why I'm again proud to say that this uh, Premier made the largest investment in phosphorus reduction in that uh, watershed's history, Speaker. And we're working with municipalities right now and the region to implement that project. You know, the first time I ever heard members opposite ask about uh, this important phosphorus reduction initiative was when the member from Hamilton, uh, West Ancaster Dundas, wrote to me asking why is it, it hasn't happened uh, sooner, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's not lost on me or anyone in the Lake Simcoe watershed that when that uh, party had the opportunity to prop the previous Liberal government up, they, vo they voted to send sewage Response. into Lake Simcoe, the shallow receptor body, and it was just shocking. Shocking to Chief Big Canoe, shocking to neighbouring municipalities. We're going to work with Question the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, Conservative Bill 124 is an unconstitu unconstitutional attack on the working people of Ontario. Superior Court of Justice Marcus Conan said Bill 124 infringes on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm quoting, Speaker, the government was using its legislative power to avoid real collective bargaining and to tilt the balance of power in favour of the government. It is difficult to see how there can be an effective collective bargaining system when the employer has been given the trump card of compensation increases lower than the rate of inflation and lower than freely bargained agreements. Speaker, all Ontarians have paid the price for the Premier's wage capping Bill 124. Just look at the staffing crisis that have hit our hospitals and our schools as workers quit feeling disrespected, overworked and underpaid. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier finally show Bill 124 the door or will he continue to attack workers by appealing the ruling from the Superior Court of Justice? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government uh, has made historic and unprecedented investments into health care. And the fact is, the members opposite, uh, for the uh, leaders of the opposition and the opposition party, have voted against every single one of those measures, wow. Mr. Speaker. When it's we terrible. launched the terrible. largest uh, recruitment uh, of health and human resources in this province, which attracted almost 14,000 uh, nurses to register. All of those measures that we put in place to make that happen, the members opposite voted against every single one of those Shame. Me me measures. Shame. When we increased health care funding last year by over $5.2 billion, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the largest uh, uh, increase uh, in the history of this province. The members opposite voted against every single Response? dollar of that they do increase. That? No, no, uh, no. Mr. Speaker, our government uh, will continue to make historic and unprecedented investments uh, into health care, and we hope the members opposite support us in those investments. 
a supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. He didn't even come close to answering the question. You know what we voted against? Bill 28 when you attacked education That's workers. Exactly what right. we voted against was Bill 124 when you attacked public sector workers. And we'll do it again. Keep doing it. Speaker, New Democrats believe that investing in nurses is the best way to improve access to timely, safe, and quality health care. But unfortunately, Conservative Bill 124 treats health care heroes as health care zeros. Yep. And as a result, many nurses have left the profession. We all know this. Those that remain continue to face increasing levels of violence, exhaustion, burnout, and PTSD. Because bad Bill 124 is unconstitutional, the Ontario Nurses Association went to arbitration speaker, and the arbitrator's decision increased benefits, wages, premiums, and vacations for ONA's nonprofit nursing home health care professionals. Speaker, 60,000 of ONA's frontline health care professionals will be negotiating a new contract with the Ontario health, uh, Hospital Association. My question. question is, will the Premier kill Bill 124, or will the Conservatives continue to fight Ontario's workers with this un unconstitutional wage gap? The Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, in terms of nursing environments, our government has invested $73 million over three years to train and provide clinical placements for over 16,000 PSWs and nursing students. In addition, $35 million to increase nursing enrollment wow. to add 2,000 nurses to the health care system, $34 million over four years to increase enrollment at six Indigenous institutes, $100 million to add 2,000 nurses to the long-term care sector by 2024-25. Eligible PSWs will, con will receive up to $6,000 a year. We also have a nursing program transformation partnering with MCU and LTC that will increase access to nursing programs at publicly assisted colleges. Mr. Speaker, we're investing in PSWs, nurses, Spons. colleges and universities, and international students, Order. international nurses, and recruitment. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.